law in 1976 in the first class. I'd like to acknowledge that this is the law school's 40th anniversary and that in addition to <laughs> Governor Weisha A, we also have Polka Lainui, who is also a graduate of the first class. He was a delegate to the 1978 Constitutional Convention, was instrumental in the establishment of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, and of course he was the first Native Hawaiian governor of the state of Hawaii. So governor the Hawaii illegal Hawaii. state of Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> I got stripped of my credentials. <laughs> you know, um, first of all, thank you very much. I, I wanted to maybe begin by um, telling you that we are, I am, this uh, discussion tonight is really the brainchild or the result of people like Dr. Sai and uh, Bill Chang and others. I mean, it is our continuous evolution uh, and recognition uh, uh, as, as a nation, as the existence of a nation. So, um, in a, in a way, just like both, uh, both individuals talked about their evolution to start with, maybe a little bit about mine, okay? Because I can remember a long time ago when I first came to, for example, came to the law school here, and we only, we had, uh, I think it was six members of our class that were Native Hawaiian. And one, uh, and then uh, as we went along for a few months, one afternoon, one of us decided that the six of us should meet, but not on campus. <laughs> okay, and so we went, uh, we went off to somebody's house and we all sat down and started talking about various things. And then this person leaned forward and he said, I want to talk about sovereignty and Hawaiian independence. And the five of the rest of us looked at him and there was Poka. <laughs> and and, and uh, the important point about that was that it, this was back in 1973, mm -hmm. and it was a whispering conversation. Today, we are talking here at the University of Hawaii Law School about our existence of, as a nation and saying it openly, which is a period of development. You know, for me, one of the great moments was representing Walter's friends uh, at the, uh, for the Kaho'olawe Ohana in a trial. And Professor McKenzie, I'm not going to tell how I got involved. She got me drunk one night. <laughs> <laughs> but that's beside the point. The point is that we were probably the only lawyers that these defendants could afford. Uh, and, and we, we went and we worked hard and we represented them and we thought we presented the best cases that we could as lawyers and we went into the courtroom and we did all of that and we thought we were doing really well and we lost <laughs> and our clients went to jail some of them were probation you know and it woke something in my mind that sometimes it's not all about the legality. Sometimes it's about who's got the power to do something. And I remember us all coming downstairs after being told that our friends were going to be sentenced uh, into, into the, by the federal court and standing around holding hands pulling singing and being very angry and I remember swearing to myself that I'm tired of losing tired of losing this is you know we can have the best cases the best things in the world, but you're only presenting it to a court that's not yours. So what influences events? <laughs> what makes things happen? 
And really, when they asked me to be chairman of the uh, Road Commission, these are the kinds of thoughts that were running through my mind. Because I have absolutely no doubt that Hawaii is in an illegal occupation. I have absolutely no doubt. I mean, you, you, you got to be illiterate not to finally get to that point. I have absolutely no doubt that we were illegally overthrown. I have absolutely no doubt that this is all about force. You see, we hear about what the Queen went through. Queen Liliokalani with the guns were facing uh, her palace. And we think, wow, you know, they were pointing guns. What we don't remember or recall was that three years prior to the United States military landing before Iolani Palace, they were involved in something called the Wounded Knee Massacre, where the United States, where there were 500 Native Americans, or 300 something Native Americans, practicing their religion. And the United States troops approached them. Now these are unarmed, unarmed civilians. Nobody knows who, but somebody fired a shot. And the same military that pointed their guns at Iolani Palace killed every single man, woman, and child that was there uh, in their worship ceremony. See? And not, it was so bad that 50 United States soldiers were also killed from friendly fire. See, This is what the Queen was facing. This is about power. So I have no doubt that we have now the ability or we have the justification for seeking our own government or the restoration. I have no doubt, by the way, that our nation exists. But the real question is, how do we influence those events? And Keanu and I have had this discussion. So I am looking at it from a political point of view. You know, there, oh, this whole idea, we use words like sovereignty. One concept is this idea of cultural sovereignty. And it's true. We exist as a community and a people. We existed before any Westerner came here. We didn't have to be told who we were. We exercised dominion of the land. We did everything. And so the idea is, no matter what, our legacy as being the first people here is the idea that sovereignty is inherent in us. This is our islands. It will always be our islands. There's also this concept of political sovereignty, which is the ability, the governmental power to exercise authority without outside inter interference, which is what Kihano talked about, a nation state. And it requires something called recognition. Actually, it also existed when we were only a kingdom and everybody left us alone because the chiefs had to recognize each other. Otherwise, it would be just, you know, chaos. But internationally speaking, in 1843, we got accepted because we had the first federal recognition. And the first federal recognition that came to the Hawaiian kingdom was a treaty. It was recognizing us as a sovereign power. What is recognition? In order to begin this, we have to think about a definition of recognition. What consists of recognition? What happens? What makes recognition? Why, what is this word? And in order to just break through a million cases or whatever and get down to the essence, recognition really involves two things. It involves, first of all, an acknowledgement of nationhood. Yes, there is a Hawaiian kingdom. It exists. And then it takes the modification of behavior 
on the half of the part of those that are doing the recognizing. It's not enough to just say they exist. They exist and now we're going to have a relationship. We're going to do a treaty. We're going to do something. See, that's why the apology bill is not enough. I learned that the hard way. We thought we had a great success. We passed the apology bill. The United States said they were illegally in Hawaii, blah, 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 blah. And then 15 years later, the Supreme Court says, yeah, but that's just saying, I'm sorry, that's not paying a fine. You see, there was no modification of behavior. It needs to be both. Now, with regard to what we were trying to do with the Roll Commission is something called self-recognition. See, we're in the body of an occupation. What do you need to do to get started? We are a nation. Recognize ourselves. Acknowledge that we exist. Modify our behavior. How do we modify our behavior? We act like a nation. We begin to stand for things. We elect our own representatives. We do things. We act like a nation. Now, the beautiful thing about self-recognition is that there are no external constraints. Once you start to do this, you're constrained by the people who are willing to participate. This concept is not new. Probably the most effective form of self-recognition was Kalahui at one point in time. Others are doing it right now. The challenge was for us, as we looked at the commission and for me, can we do it with 100,000 people? Can we get 100,000 or 150,000 people to get together and to start to act like a nation and a government? You see? That was the whole, that's the idea. Now, when you get past self-recognition, what do you do? Again, political recognition. That's the next step, the external. What do we do with external people? First thing, acknowledgement that our nation exists and establish government-to-government -government relationships, whatever they are. Right now, we have a number of things going on. You got Act 195. The state passes this act, not the greatest law in the world. The only good thing about it is that it gave us an opportunity to play with it. State of nowhere. All right? So you got Act 195, the state says, yes, there's a nation. Fine, thank you. You got the Hawaiian laws, uh, you got the federal government, 200 laws saying all kinds of things, despite the, all the illegal acts, but they exist as a nation, yeah. And an apology bill. You got on the international level, Dr. Ke uh, Kehano's work, among others, Dr. Sai's work, where, you know, the important thing is not so much winning an arbitration, it is the fact that they're even considering it. So on the international level, you have a precedent for the recognition of the existence of a Hawaiian nation. That's one half of complete rec political recognition. What we need to do, and what this initiative was attempting to do, was establish the government so that we can have government-to-government -government relationships. So what is going to be, once the, once the state of Hawaii says, I recognize you as Kanaka Maoli, what does that mean? I knew that before this. I also know everything else. But what does that mean? What does that mean to stolen lands? What does that mean to our people? The same thing with the United States. You pass an apology resolution, what does that mean? How do we interact with each other? What is the next step? The same thing on the national level. Now, I'm going to get through this. Uh, <clears throat> in the process of establishing this, these relationships, we have an agenda. There are certain considerations. The first consideration is what's going to be the structure of any self-recognized government. 
The second is, what is going to be the relationship of this self-recognized government to any of these other institutions? And the third is the welfare of our people. How do we mold those people willing to participate in this kind of an expression into a community, into a force? How, does it, how is it possible for us to take X number of 100,000 people on a Hawaiian issue and they all act as a nation, whatever it is? Unfortunately, in my opinion, the priority and the focus is always on structure and relationships, and where it ought to really be is on the welfare of the people. Um, because that's our determination. How does this make life better? How does this make life better for all of us? That's the guiding light. That's what this is an attempt to do. You see, I believe that in reality, we are facing the same kind of challenges that the Queen faced, that everybody faced in their time. We have to deal with this rogue United Nation, I mean, United States. We have to deal with it just like they did. And it's not only a question of reading about what they did, it's a question of developing the leadership to respond to the challenges and the realities that they faced as they are being morphed into today. So, Kanai Oluvalu is an attempt to try and fulfill this kind of an objective. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Well, when you start to get into crimes, you get into intent, elements, those kind of things. So those are important issues, especially with criminal aspects. You not only have crimes under Hawaiian law, which is treason, but you also have crimes under international law in the FM 27-10 and Geneva and blah, blah, blah. So I think it's what, what I would like tonight to have been and to be is this is information that is coming out. Yeah? And we're all at different stages because John is a friend of mine, okay? But John has his views based upon his knowledge which isn't to turn it off where I can't talk to him, because we do talk, but we, have, we, we exchange them. So I look at John as actually, you know, we can kuka kuka and not bash each other. Because the one thing I didn't want to do is, I could be put in John's place back in 1993 when I was a battery commander for 105 houses. How am I going to defend that one? <laughs> well, I didn't know. But I'm just saying it takes different levels. So I'm very careful to throw the the criminal aspects out and I want to make sure that people have been apprised has been apprised because one of the elements under war crimes provided by the Rome statute in the International Criminal Court is that they had to have known what was going on and then they moved yeah now to what degree they moved after they knew I don't want to play prosecutor I just want to make it as if yeah, I didn't know my auntie didn't know because once I start throwing that sword around, which is double edged, I got my cousin right next to me. He might be doing the same thing. You see what I'm saying? That's why what's amazing about this occupation is that the occupier and the occupied have become blurred. Before it was black and white. We our kupuna knew who the military was when they came in because you know why they spoke another language. Today, we all speak English. We serve in the military, it's like the civilians took over, the military retreated to the back. So here at the university, it's important to keep it academic. It's important to take it to the level of pushing the envelope. Very, very profound ramifications, because I can tell you it's already happening in court where judges are being reported for war crimes. But they weren't just being reported, they've been apprised of the information, because what's happening is the elements are being fulfilled before it takes off. That's why people have to be very careful what's going on. So, see, I know I didn't answer it fully, but around the boat. <clears throat> I'm going to be short. Yeah. Who else wants to talk? We have no. other questions. Or, or oh, I'm going to be short. Okay. Um, <laughs> in fact, I'm going to tell a joke. <laughs> there was this crowd, and there was this woman, and all of them were stoning the woman. And it was very unfair. It's good to story. <laughs> And this man says, let he without sin cast the first stone. And so this woman from the back comes with this, kind of picks up this boulder and moves and she can hardly carry the boulder. And then he throws it on the woman, killing her. And the man says, mother, sometimes you make me so mad. <laughs> <laughs> of a journey of knowledge. And when I talk about the state of emergency being the United States, how has it been able to govern us for 100 years without putting guns at our yeah. head? It's us. Yeah. We're problems. The law school is a problem. Why? Because <laughs> judges and lawyers have a duty of candor and truth. Judges on their own have to tell the courts, tell the attorneys, there's no jurisdiction. It's a duty of zealous representation for attorneys to present the best defense. And isn't the best defense that there's no jurisdiction? So the attorneys are involved, the judges are involved. But not only that, it's not just Hawaiians who are being oppressed by this, by this lack of jurisdiction. It's everybody in the, the whole Hawaiian Islands. And not only that, going back to the Kukui petitions, they were the true. They knew what was right. They knew what they wanted. They wanted to stop the, the Treaty of Education. And they did. How? Because they got the American people against the Treaty of Annexation. It was not the Hawaiians who didn't sign the Treaty of Annexation. It was the Americans who didn't sign the Treaty of Annexation because the American people were against annexation. They knew it was wrong. It was a few individuals like McKinley, John Foster Dulles, William Rufus Day, who are the criminals. 
we should bond with the American people who had their constitution manhandled and mangled by the occupation and taking of away. In other words, it's a lot larger in terms of responsibility. We're all at different stages. That's why I, I don't think it's fair to, to be critical of the governor. Um, he, was, he was there 30 years ago. <laughs> Okay. Oh, okay. Governor. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. <laughs> I, I, I don't think so, by the way. So we can talk later. You know, I, I'm sitting here listening to the discussion, and it reminds me of going back to the 70s, 80s, and 90s. There are certain stages of this process of decolonization. I know Keanu takes offense to the term decolonization, but I'm going to use it. The first is a stage of recovery and rediscovery, which seems like exactly what we're going through, rediscovering that history, understanding what has gone on. And there's an element of the second stage, the mourning phase, the anger, the bitterness that I can hear it here, and we've heard it back in the 70s and the 80s with uh, very uh, bitter discussions, especially at the University of Hawaii. The third and the fourth stage, the third stage being the dreaming stage, and the fourth stage being the formation to build consensus is what, John, you are addressing and asking that other question, not to build a nation based on historical injustices, but how do we build a nation based on the best future Hawaii can have? Exactly. And what you are trying to do is build a, a grouping or a process in which 100,000 people can gather together, hold a convention, and start discussing that next stage before we hit the fifth stage, the execution stage. My question is, though, that in 1996, we had an election of delegates to a convention. And in that case, we didn't take a role, but we said any boy in Hawaii, from any place in the world, irrespective of citizenship, irrespective of civil uh, rights being taken away as a result of conviction or whatever it is, we opened the list wide. And we did that, and we elected 79 delegates to sit in a convention. The state has refused, along with the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, to continue the funding of that convention, which was a result of a public uh, election process. And so my question is, why should we support a Kanai Oluvalu, which is a substitution for what already exists, but has never been allowed to complete its work so that we can get to the next step and post the two options of integration or independence and let the people decide. Thank right. you. Right. And um, as you know, I, I'm very familiar with that, that history. Right? You appointed us. Yeah. <laughs> and, and actually, I was, and, and um, that was. I think the reason, well, first of all, to answer your question, the specific question, is that in those days we had something called the Office of Hawaiian Affairs voting list, which was that we had, uh, we had a, a record of people who were all participating as, um, as Native Hawaiians in the process. And frankly, if we still had that list, I don't know why we would need to roll today. And as you know, at the very moment, well then, you know, one thing is that, I hate to say it this way, but when I left office, nobody thought that the crazy ideas that we had should be funded, right? I mean, this, that's why you should never trust government. Anyway, uh, because they changed, they changed the opinion. But anyway, what happened was when the Hawk Convention uh, came out with their products, and it was supposed to go out for a uh, referendum, it was the exact same year that the United States Supreme Court invalidated the OHO voting list. And so there was no, there was no body to submit the, uh, the, the, um, the, the pro work product to. Obviously, people took advantage of that fact because some people just didn't want that thing submitted. So, period. So we disappeared, that disappeared. And essentially, what I personally am hoping is that we actually pick up where we left off. I don't think we should have a convention that starts 
like brand new, you know, I mean, my personal view, which I've been trying to get uh, over to uh, buy to, is that they should really pick up exactly where the, uh, the last convention left off. I mean, this is just a continuation of the same thing. So we're, we have three more, Jordan, and then the same man, and then we'll end with you. Thank you. Thank you for coming for the panel. Um, I just had a question. It's somewhat about Kanaya Lobalu, but I think any of you guys can answer. Um, I was wondering, we keep saying that the government coming out of Kanaya Lobalu can be whatever we want it to be, the structure of it. And I just wonder how that's possible, given the fact that it's a state agency doing it, and how could that, how could that fund or support a movement to remove a state from the union? And given the language from the act that says that the state supports federal recognition, I just wonder where we get that idea that we can do whatever we want. And I, I would, would like the opinion of some of the uh, of town too about whether you think a result from that would include our uh, arguments as well internationally. That's a good question. Pick up. Well, first of all, you know, the, um, I think that the mere fact that something may have originated with the state doesn't medic, uh, negate the positive thing that can be done from it by itself. In other words, what I'm saying is that you wouldn't, for example, you wouldn't like stop protecting the EV because you have to use a state law to do it, all right? So, Kanai Oluvalu, uh, I mean, Act 195 is an opportunity for Hawaiians to do something that would not be available otherwise. That's the way I look at it. Now, once you form the convention, convention itself is separate uh, from the state. It's actually where OHA should have been by now, which is completely disconnected. Okay. At that moment in time, the state regulations, state whatever, with regard to how the convention ought to do itself, it is not applicable. The, 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 the delegates themselves have to decide that issue. Now, does that mean that the illegal power, the state's power, disappears? No, I mean, if you get a traffic ticket, you're still going to have to pay the fine, unless you pay the penalty. But that doesn't, they, they don't control what the product that you bring out of the convention. And what people forget is that the product that came out of the Ha Convention was the fact that we should be independent. People forget that what led to the Ha Convention was a referendum from Native Hawaiians passed four to one which said that there ought to be a convention put together for us to discuss these issues and go forward. It was that convention, that effort, that was shortchanged by the state government when at the very critical moment when they defunded the whole thing and then they wouldn't allow for any money to take it out of the referendum. In a sense, you're trying to get back to that moment and then go from there. <clears throat> when you look at this whole issue that we're going through, we have to call it what it is. It's, it's an extension of Americanization. Yes, yes. It is. It's an extension of Americanization. It's, it's nothing new. So it started in 1906. We've been led to believe something that's not true. We're now operating on the mindset that we can do certain things when in fact it really has no consequence. It won't. It's, um, well, let me explain. 1959, everybody voted. How many people voted? 94%. 94% vote, included natives. That didn't do anything. Hawaii's still an occupied state, and if anything, that vote is an extension of an illegality that is considered Americanization. Now we tend to think, well, Native Hawaiians can do it now. But the Native Hawaiians are not the sole you might say beneficiaries of being an independent state. You also have foreign nationals that are living here, and according to the treaties with the Hawaiian Kingdom, they're actually protected under that treaty. 
That's what Switzerland sees. See, we gotta keep in mind that we not only were an independent state, we still are an independent state, but we're occupied. To think that we can choose to be independent doesn't make sense. You don't choose to become independent again. You actually are. You are. It's a presumption of continuity, but we need to utilize international law to understand this. Right now, nobody's talking international law. In particular, we're supposed to be talking international humanitarian law, which deals with the civilian population and the process by which rights are protected during occupation. See, nobody's talking about international humanitarian law or the law of occupation or the Geneva or Hague Convention, because we don't know. I had to learn that as part of my, that's my expertise. But when I listen to everybody here, all I hear is Act 195, well that's a state enactment, which is an illegal regime limited to US territory. See, we're right back to that no treaty. So the process by which to address this and to resolve the problem that we have, knowing and keeping in mind we've been Americanized. We always have to keep in mind first we're Americanized and that's a check on us. We need to understand international law to just understand what's going on. Not to say I know international law because I'm going to make this guy do this. No, no, I'm not saying that. Power is the ability to get somebody to do something they wouldn't normally do. I'm not into conventional power because we don't have it, military, political, economic. We don't. What I got is leverage. How do I create leverage and get John to do something he wouldn't normally do and he's a Swiss government? I need to find a vested interest in the Swiss government, maybe John. We all criminals. Where he asked it. But I'm not going to start calling names because you know what I want to do? I'm not going to be able to talk to anybody. Yeah. I need to find a way to talk. So in a, in, I actually documented a term that I made up. See, political scientists can make up words and start to use it in larger articles. And I actually call this term, <laughs> see, none of you know you can make up words. It's called reverse power relation differential. <laughs> And it was published. And it means political jujitsu. <laughs> to take the power and to <clears throat> twist it. That's called Lua. So if we're going to play Hawaiian, stop thinking Hawaiian. And the one thing that I would highly suggest everyone here, not to think of what we think we should do, I think we should go back and ask ourselves, what would somebody who knew who they were who knew the country instead of us just realizing the country, like Joseph Navahi, James Kaulia, David Kalau Kalani. Not just the Queen, there are many nationals, including Paul Newman. Paul Newman's howling, but he's Hawaiian. Hawaiian subject. What would they do given our situation? Because they knew who they were, they knew what the laws were, and Navahi was very fluent in international law. In fact, he was, for a while, Minister of Foreign Affairs. See, these things we cannot That's forget. Really, that's really that's the key. Because remember, we are who we were. Let's go back to who we were to understand how we do certain things. Instead of here trying to argue with each other, and we've all been Americanized, and who is louder than the other guy? <laughs> and what does it serve? Nothing. So that's the key, because we've got to keep that in mind. citizens would be aliens, but they would be protected by the constitutional rights of the nation. No, exactly, because within a country, you see, sovereignty is supreme authority over the territory. Now, how you exercise that authority over that territory will determine geopolitically where you're at. So if I'm in Saudi Arabia, then that's sub sovereignty authority, and I'm not Saudi, but I'm an alien in Riyadh, it might be subject to a few issues of religious law, a bit of absolutism, and so forth. So it depends where you're at. But if you look at the Hawaiian Kingdom, it had adopted the Separation of Powers Doctrine in 1864, which is the cornerstone of constitutional law. Nobody knows that. Queen Lilibo Kalani was a chief executive, not an absolute monarch. 
So when we look at the country, how was the country then and who benefited? Well, as Williamson stated, everybody. But there's a difference between what is called political rights and civil rights. Aliens have civil rights, okay, but not political rights. People who are Hawaiian subjects, irresp irrespective of race, color, creed, have both political and civil rights. And if the alien wishes to have political rights, he gets naturalized. You know, but all these answers to these questions, actually, in the Kingdom era, you actually got them in the court cases, the laws. It's amazing what you have there. We, we, we think today that was a banana republic and we need to create something different. No. I remember one person, uh, I'm not going to point him out, but he knows. <laughs> one, of, one, one of the students of mine thought that, uh, that the position was, and I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to say it in such a way that it may not have happened in that way. Okay. <laughs> Donovan. <laughs> the, 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 question, the, 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 question, the point that came up in class, in the graduate class, was the United States controlled the Hawaiian Kingdom. Why we got to learn all this stuff? But we're just learning how they controlled the Mahele, they forced the constitution on the king. These are all urban legends. Yeah. But they said, but the understanding is the United States controlled the Hawaiian Kingdom. Okay, so, so, so my point was, you know, that springs a good question for research. If the United States controlled the Hawaiian Kingdom, then why did they have to overthrow it in 1893? So you don't overthrow something you're in control of. Now you might be in control, and you were in control after the overthrow, but not before. And Donovan, I'm gonna pull him out, I'm on his doctoral committee, <laughs> he did his research and he covered the land, to land issue, the Mahele. Very different than how everybody's looking at it today, but he saw it through and interpreting it through the law, through the records, through the facts, as well as the politics. And it was completely different how people are understanding it today, but he's using original source documents. And he was uh, awarded the best master's thesis in the Pacific Rim. And now, uh, and now he's going for his PhD, and he's in the PhD program, and I'm honored to be on his committee. But I'm going to push it, I'm going to push it. But the, what, what the point I want to finish off with is, you got to make sure you ask the right questions. Like Thomas Pynchon said in Over the Rainbow, he said, if you get people to ask the wrong questions, you don't have to answer them. <laughs> so the key is answer, asking the right questions. Yeah, I think that, uh, well, first of all, you're talking about sovereignty, and you're talking about the Hawaiian state. Um, that was a, a nation that was open to all of its nationals, which included both Hawaiians and non-Hawaiians. But I think in terms of the resurgence of the issue of sovereignty, the people who have the most attachment to it in today's uh, society are the first people in these islands, a native Hawaiian. They are the people that, in, uh, that uh, have the most attachment to their concept and, and would like to bring it back again. And in a sense, they are the originator of the sovereignty even for the nation state. Because if they weren't here organizing and uh, establishing itself and welcoming the additional people, they would have been neither. So, yes, to that extent, it has become a Native Hawaiian issue. Now, I think though, for me personally, the whole discussion of sovereignty actually transcends all of that. And that is that I think that the most cutting issue of ultimately, and this is going to sound controversial, but ultimately, it's not all the legal theories, it's not even our history. What should drive, at least for me, is the, is the cultural concept that we are seeking sovereignty because it is good for our people, everybody, including Hawaiians and non-Hawaiians alone. I mean, I believe that a Hawaiian point of view on how we govern these islands is precisely what is needed if these islands are going to survive beyond this century. And that is the motivation for us to seek uh, uh, to seek self-governance, to seek independence, to seek whatever, and the restoration of sovereignty. Now that's, for me, on a personal level. But if you're looking at it from a, you know, like an academic or a legal level, yeah, it's, it's the relationship between 
the state. I think we'll take our final question. Um, by the way, you know, this is all confusion, John. We know that. And I'm, and I'm knowing very well. Again, you're your business law partner, Mr. Proto, yeah? Yeah. The rights of my people take precedence. This is my part of the world. This is my point of origin. This is my people. Exactly like what the petitions were all about. We abided by their rules and we won for our benefit as a homogenous society and as a society that was inclusive of others that were possibly different in packaging but their na'au was for us, this people. They continued to complement the blessings of this specific spot in the universe. That needs to be mindful whenever talking about Hawaii today. It's all confusion now. So it is, just always understand, we, I refuse to allow our people to continue to be statistics in their system. The most overweight, the most diabetic, most on drugs and alcohol, the most in prison. Our answer is to come back home to our kumulipo. And hawa is that simple. No kuka involved. It continues to be kukai kukai. Nice and easy. You're either for Hawaii or you're part of the Hawaii that is today. So be very mindful of that. There's no discussion. You're either of truth and integrity of the koko of this people. If you wish to participate, e komo mai. Continue to be complementing the blessings of what really is magnificent about Hawaii. Not deteriorating it and rotting it. Again, it just becomes a cancer. I mean, you folks are, are living with cancer, living with another way to do, have another band-aid to remedy and be that American. Aole, wean yourself from that shit. Come back to our heaven, not their heaven end. Um, okay, um, I know that there are many more questions, but we do have to end tonight. And actually, so what I'm going to do is promise that we will have these three gentlemen back sometime in the next. <laughs> See, she, she used to have to get me drunk before. <laughs> now she just takes advantage of that. In the next three months to continue this discussion. So hold me to my word. I'd like to end the evening by 